a little bit of a Brazilian jazz lesson for you. Getz and Gilberto released 1964. It's Stan Getz and Zhao Gil- Gilberto. It's currently 51 on the Best Ever Albums chart for the 60s. Getz and Gilberto. Gilberto is considered one of the best-selling jazz albums of all time and the album that popularized Bossa Nova around the world. But Josh, what is Bossa Nova? I'm glad you asked, listeners, because I'm going to tell you. Nice. (laughs) Bossa Nova is Portuguese for new trend or new wave. It is a union of samba and jazz that originated in Rio de Janeiro. Samba itself is considered both a musical genre and type of dance. Samba is considered one of the cornerstones of Brazilian national identity. It can also be considered a fusion of jazz and indigenous Brazilian music. Bossa Nova is in 2-4 time, so two quarter notes per beats per measure. And it is a syncopated rhythm and relaxed tempo. It's also characterized by non-operatic style reminiscent of Brazilian folk tunes. So in contrast to jazz before then in brazil which was very like operatic and vocal this is much more laid back Um, it's also characterized by romantic and wistful lyrics that talk about nature love and longing and women and even if you don't understand portuguese i think you can get that from this album it incorporates jazz chords and harmonies and the key instruments in bossa nova are the classical acoustic guitar the bass, the cabasa, which is the wood and metal shaker that plays an unending pulse, which I'm sure you guys heard throughout the whole album. For sure. Yep. And uh, also the claves, which are wooden sticks that play a clicking pattern that calls back to the traditional um, Brazilian music. And and then the lead instruments like the saxophone that Stan Getz plays. The prevailing vocal style in Brazilian samba was loud and operatic so bossa nova was in reaction to that that's something to keep in mind so whereas we think of bossa nova and when you hear this album if you're not familiar with the history of jazz we think of it as elevator music this bossa nova was created in reaction to a style of jazz that was much more loud and outgoing and and higher intensity and this is obviously different than that the other thing is to keep in mind is, is that Bossa Nova is considered a political uh, opposite what Matt talked about in uh, with Ushmatantes and the Tropicalia movement, which was in episode nine, if you want to hear more about that. Well worth a, a deep dive back into the stacks Definitely. for that one. You'll, you'll hear the difference right away yeah. um, and get some more history about Brazil as well. So. Um, Stan Getz was American, I should add, and João Gilberto was Brazilian, and I'm going to go into both of them as well. And another key figure in this is Antonio Jobim, also known as Tom. That was his nickname. Um, <laughs> Gilberto course. and Jobim are considered the fathers of Bossa Nova. Um, and between 1959 and 1961, Jobim worked on Gilberto's first three albums in Brazil. So a little bit about João Gilberto, since he is very important he was born in 1931 he died last year in 2019 he's known in brazil as omito which is the legend now there was not a lot of i could not get a lot of good biographical information on the internet about him in fact i tried to even just see if there was biographies and stuff out there um about him and and there's nothing so maybe it's the fact that he's brazilian and maybe there's a lot of you know portuguese uh work on him that hasn't been translated but i couldn't find a lot Um, and i found wikipedia's entries lacking as well Um, he started his musical career at age 18 as a singer Um, he then joined a band um, in in brazil he got his first guitar at age 14 and then between 51 and 59 he released singles as a singer and guitarist in 1959 Gilberto released Chega de Saudade which is an album that is not only considered the first Bossa Nova album but also the title track which is considered the first Bossa Nova song so that's kind of where Bossa Nova I mean he literally invented it and that's where yeah. it comes from um, so now a little bit about Stan Getz Stan Getz was 
uh, born in 1927 and died in 1991. He was a, an American jazz saxophonist born and raised in Philadelphia, and his nickname was The Sound. He had been playing in bands and was a musician since the age of 16. He gained prominence playing for band leader Woody Herman, and the, his band was known as uh, The Second Herd. Now, he had various iterations of his band, like, so the first one was called The Herd, and this one was called The Second Herd. The saxophonists in the group were known as the Four Brothers. And then he had so much success in this band that he went on to launch a solo career. In the mid to late 50s, he played a cool jazz with various quintets and sextets in Europe. And then he returned to America in 1961. This is where Stan Getz was introduced to Bossa Nova. And that's how he gets kind of, this is why he gets uh, associated with with Gilberto. So uh, another musician, Charlie Bird, who was a guitarist, was responsible for bringing Bossa Nova records back to the U.S. to begin with. Now he went on a U.S.-sponsored state tour of Brazil to play jazz with a bunch of other musicians and to play with Brazilian um, jazz players. And when he came back, Get saw him play in 61 at the Showboat Lounge here in D.C., and requested that they record an album together. So Getz really liked the sound of, of Bossa Nova from hearing Charlie Bird play it. So that album became known as Jazz, um, Jazz Samba and came out in April 1962 by Getz and Charlie Bird. And that was the first Bossa Nova album recorded by American jazz musicians. And that was recorded here in D.C. at All Souls Unitarian Church, February 13, 1962, and that church is still still here. I looked it up. Uh, Jazz Samba is considered the album that started the Bossa Nova craze in America. Getz won a Grammy for the Best Jazz Performance in 1963 for a Desafinado off of that album, and he continued to record Bossa Nova albums leading up to Getz and Bil Gilberto. Now, the third key component in this uh, trio is Antonio Tom Jobin. He was born in 27, died in 1994. His he, friends, I believe, call him Tom, Josh. Yes, 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 definitely. That's what he was known as. He was the composer and the songwriter and the pianist on Getz and Gilberto, and he was closely associated, as I said before, with Gilberto. Um, they worked previously together, and he is also known as the father of Bossa Nova. He became prominent in Brazil for writing the music for a famous play called Orfeo de Conceição, which is Orpheus of the Conception. In 1956, it then became a film in 1959 titled Black Orpheus. Uh, it's basically the story of Orpheus set during Carnival in Brazil. It's a pretty good movie. And then Joe Ben wrote a, score f a new score for that film as well. Um, in 1959, Zhao Gilberto recorded his first album, as I said before, and with two of the most famous songs written by Tom Jobim, Tessa Finado and Chega de Sed Saudade. Um, and Jobim also produced that album. So you have two fathers of Bossa Nova basically working together to create the first Bossa Nova albums in Brazil. Okay, this, this all leads us up to... I'm getting to the actual album, sorry for going long, but I wanted to make sure everyone, all the pieces were set in place. On November 21st, 1962, the first North American concert of Bossa Nova, the New Brazilian Jazz, was presented at Carnegie Hall by Gilberto, Joe Bim, and other Brazilian musicians. After this, the record producer Creed Taylor wanted Joe Bim and Gilberto to meet Stan Getz for his quote, historical documentation of the genre style. So that's how all of these guys came together to make Getz and Gilberto. So now we have reached the point where this album was produced. It was recorded March 18th and 19th, 1963, and released March of 1964. It was recorded at A&R Studios in New York City and released by Verve Records. The artwork for the album was done by Olga Albizu, who was an abstract expressionist painter from Puerto Rico. And she did some other um, uh, Bossa Nova uh, albums as well. The Girl from Ipanema won Grammy for Record of the Year in 1965. 
which is the sing, uh, first song off this album. Getz and Gilberto run, won received Grammy Awards for Best Jazz Instrumental Album, um, Individual or Group, and Best Engineered Recording, Non-Classical. It also became the first non-American album to win for Album of the Year in 1965, and it was the first jazz album to ever win Album of the Year. Um, another important person that I don't want to leave out is Estrude Gilberto, which is um, Zhao's wife. She sings the English vocals on this, um, on the two tracks on this album, on Girl From Ipanema. She is ostensibly the girl from Ipanema <laughs> by singing that song, and um, also on the um, the other song about. Uh, I'm drawing a blank on the name of the album, but I'll, or the song, but I'll I'll find it. Um, she had never sung professionally before this album, and. And so this is kind of her foray into Bossa Nova, and, and she's still alive too, I should add. Um, oh, Corcovado is the other song that she sings on this. Um, Jobin co-wrote nearly all the songs on this album except tracks two and three. And despite their collaboration, Getz and Gilberto did not meld stylistically. Um, Getz was much more... Uh, what I read is like a harder player and Gilberto was more laid back and that, they kind of clashed that way. And they often disagreed as to which take was the best um, to use. And the producer Creed Taylor shelved this album for a year thinking that it was going to be a commercial failure. And obviously that's not the case because it sold more than 2 million copies in 1964 alone. And I will add uh, my final thing before I let you guys speak, since I'm sure you're tired of hearing me speak, is that uh, the collaboration between Getz and Gilberto ended because uh, Estru Gilberto had a love affair with Stan Getz at one point. Oh, oh. Yeah. I, was, that, I did that not see that coming. be a thing in the 60s. <laughs> that was a it? Kaiser yeah. Soze moment, Josh. I didn't see that coming. Holy so, cow. Yep. So that's all of the background. Um, I wanted people to know what Bossa Nova was and, and why this album is what it is. So, and I wanted to educate you guys, but what did you all think of this album? John, I, I love this. I love this album. I mean, it's such a cool atmospheric piece. Um, it's funny because it starts with such a, a well-known song that you're like, okay, instant, instantaneously recognizable. Mm -hmm. um, I am familiar with the Samba sound and to some degree, the idea of what Bossa Nova sounded like, so I wasn't totally ignorant coming into it. However, um, it just, as the album goes on, it kind of washes over you. It's such, the musicianship is excellent. I love the fusion of the saxophone playing by Getz. I, I love the singing uh, by Astrid Gilberto in the two things, but it's not on every track, so it really stands out when it shows up. Um, and the lyrics are, are perfect. Uh, to use an over, overused word, right? They're very tasteful over top of the musicianship playing and then the the background of the the sticks what were the sticks called josh i was i, I wrote down the sticks uh as the sound <laughs> that's what it was, it was you the mentioned sticks. you mentioned you mentioned them and i said i should really be more uh more knowledgeable on it but the the sticks the, are called claves claves the claves you know when they come in they work perfectly because they don't overwhelm the track and i think that's what was We've listened to other stuff where I think we've we've complained that some of these instruments that are niche instruments can overtake the track, right, and make it. You know, we saw the strings with with uh, Chelsea Girls last week. Mm -hmm. We were talking about the kazoo, you know, use of synthesizers, different stuff. But here, all of these different parts blend perfectly into the general mood and and like i said before it kind of washes over you and i know that the the stereotype of bossa nova is that it's elevator music right and that i think that's like super unfair because that comes from the shitty movie blues brothers if you've never seen it you don't need to because it's a terrible movie but that's no, i think where take. that idea comes oh that's a real hot take because <laughs> but i think that's very much where the idea that this is like elevator music comes from. But to me, it's very much you put it on and it, it changes your mood. And it's so very different than anything else we've listened to. And Josh, one of the most interesting things that you mentioned was that this was sort of in reaction to what Ush Mutantes was going against the idea of like a, a multicultural world, right? This, this sort of represents 
a, an authentic Brazilian sound, right? Mm-hmm. And it was very welcome for me because it sounds outside of the canon of American music. And I like the fact that we were sort of taken out of that and given exposure to a different sound altogether. And, and you know, Ush Mutante sounded different, but it was still rooted in things that, you know, we, we've been covering, right? This is rooted to some degree in cool jazz, which we've talked, uh, talked a little bit about, but it's its own thing entirely, the mm-hmm. instrumentation, the arrangement. Um, but it also has saxophone. So it, you know, we can compare it to things like Coltrane and Eric Dolphy and Pharaoh Sanders and stuff like that. So it was a, it was an easy thumbs up for me. I really enjoyed this album. Both times I listened to it, I listened to it at different times of the day, and in both cases, it very much put me in a, in a really nice mindset, which is what jazz is for me when it hits correctly. It puts me in a, in a mindset, and it affects my emotional side, not my cognitive side. Yep. Yeah, that's all I got. Uh, yeah, this album is smooth, right? This is just oh, yeah. like a really easy listen. Um, it was I listened to it several times, and it was uh, it was one of those things where like I didn't I didn't feel like I needed to listen to this on the headphones because this was just like this was good music to play in the morning, making breakfast, kind of like you know at night at dinner time. Man, I wish. If I was a smooth, like, bachelor kind of dude, like, ever <laughs> in my life, like, this this song, you put this on, uh, you know, after a date, bring, all the ladies are coming over, man. This is this is the Mac album to be putting on. It's very, um, it's very relaxing. It's, 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 it's easy to listen to. It's, it's just a nice sound, right? And it's right. all the instrumentation. It all blends well together. I, even though I couldn't really decipher too much from one song to the next it's got a they're all very similar sounding um it's it to me it's kind of just one long track essentially um some variations but it's just, it, the, the sound is what really is what's going here as far it, it, as opposed to kind of specific intricacies within each song um but uh you know the, i yeah this was i i really enjoyed it um it's not something that i would usually listen to uh but it is it, it, it and i would say that it is kind of elevator music because it does fit that cat because essentially at the core elevator music or whatever term you want to use the is is the type of stuff that you can put on in the background it's not going to be offensive it's not going to be um it's just going to be there right but it also speaks to the the fact that i think that just because it, it, it has those characteristics doesn't mean that it's all the same, right? That it's that it's going to fit the same kind of... You're going to get the same feel from this um, as other quote-unquote elevator music because this is really good. You know, yeah. like you can tell that these guys are, are good musicians. You could tell that uh, the structure of the songs are... are it, it's interesting. It's, 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 um, it's, a, it's a nice listen, but it's not like... It's, it's not boring. It's not, even though it is kind of, I, I don't want to say it's repetitive, but even though it's very, it's, it's very similar, it doesn't bother me. Like I could listen to this over and over again um, as one kind of sound and still be fine with it and not, not get tired of it. You know what I mean? Um, so I, I liked it a lot. Um, and it's, yeah, it's a very easy listen. You know, my, it's, I think it might've been my, my, one of my wife's favorite because she likes, she loves music like this. Um, and I t- typically don't play this at breakfast, but uh, I think I'll start doing more of that now because uh, I, I really liked it. Nice. Well, you also, you find a lot of tropes that people describe. And I, I think sometimes it, you know, you'll hear a lot like it's romantic or breezy, right? Like every time I, I went to do a description, I felt like, and, and I think some of that comes from the fact that it's people outside of the culture trying to describe a different culture that they don't totally understand, right? Um and I, I would also like to add two more things. We haven't even talked about the piano, which I think is Joe Beam, right? Yes. He um, playing the piano, the piano. And it's, mm-hmm. it's once again, it's so subtle, but always present in this album. And boy, is that a difficult skill to, to go in the background. It's similar to like Coltrane's piano play, but you could always see it directly juxtaposed against the sax. Here it like is just another piece that, once again, I've talked before about how I isolate pieces of jazz music. And one of the times I listened, I really focused on the piano work. Um, and so that was there. And Matt, would you say that uh, you talked about if, if you were a solo bachelor, would this be <laughs> making love music or would this be screwing music, Matt? Because I yeah, think this, it's making love music, right? Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's yeah. not like let's get down and dirty, James Brown, uh, Sly and the Family Stone music it's a little different so you or even different eric music. dolphy I, I think you get a little freaky with eric dolphy right 
You might not, but those jazz aficionados may. up and turning it off. I would just be like, why the hell? I'd, I'd probably leave. Like, this lady is not for me. I think if you're more experimental. Is, I'm going to call yes, John and tell him to get over here because this is his type of girl. And get experimental? So John, wait. Are you saying that you don't see you wanna... me, like with, with, with the freaky ladies that like Eric Dolphy? This, I, I, yeah. This did not I, go in the direction I expected it to go. But, Josh, what's your take right <laughs> wait, here? I, after I, your I, bio? Yes. Well... I agree. I, I really like this album. Um, one of the best quotes I heard was that this this is an album that sways what, rather than swings. And you totally mm. get that, right? It captures... What I love about it is that it captures what I imagine Brazil might be like or like the best parts of Brazil. And, and also, I as, as, associate this type of jazz with like the beach. So it always puts me in a good mood also is, that way. Is that a jazz thing for you? Cause last week you thought sketches of Spain would remind you what you imagine Spain would be like. So maybe you just need a variety yeah. of jazz pieces to get a tour of the world. So yeah, I think maybe. Josh is just upset that winter's coming and he wants to go yeah. back to the beach. He's trying yeah. to force it. Yeah. Maybe it's just too, too on the nose, but um, I also appreciate how, peaceful and understated this album is um mm. which i think i read is you know its subtlety is kind of was one of the innovative things about this type of music as well um versus the more uh you know outspoken jazz that it was playing before and i just love the i mean i love we got to give credit to Estrue gilberto's uh vocals on this too she sings really well um she she embodies those songs that she sings um, the English um, albums for. And they are arguably what made this album a hit just as much as everything else on this album. Um, that made it more accessible to American audiences, mm -hmm. I think. Um, and I just love the kind of nature that it, that n nature, even though I don't know the lyrics, but I imagine that there's, uh, talking about nature and love and and kind of you know int intimate like just smooth things like matt said and yeah it's great um it's it's an essential jazz album i would say i think yeah girl from Ip ipanema like when you look at the lyrics it's just basically about a girl and just admiring like her her beauty, but not in like a lecherous way, right? Like right. In, in in the context of the scenery, everything about the beautiful girl, beautiful scenery. You know, she the whole idea of the of her. You know, she's light, she's free, she has an aura, right? And it's mm -hmm. I think it's I think when I read the translation, it's supposed to complement how the the bossa nova sounds, like the lyrics. So yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and Gilberto Gilberto is such a good singer too on this. Um, he's really i think underrated um singing wise on this josh do you know where ipanema is well it's in rio right it's in... it's uh, it's it says well it's uh, it's it is a beach essentially it's in so peru it's isn't it uh no it's in rio um it's, in yeah, rio. it's, a, okay, it's sorry. a neighborhood a rio. fashionable sea a fashionable seaside neighborhood so it, yeah. it, it it's yeah it's right on so there's your beach josh it i know is... send, send me there that's great <laughs> <laughs> John, were you saying that you? So were you? I couldn't quite catch it. If you were saying that you you do or don't. I, feel I was like saying it was a, a making romantic. love album, not a screwing album. Matt is what I was saying because I knew you oh, were going to gotcha. go back to that. Okay, yes. gotcha. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How did I know you were going to go back there? I got, I got in before you even finished. So <laughs> yes. We know each. You know me too well. I do. Yep. But there you go. That's my. And what I mean by that, to not be overly crude, is basically the the sound of it is designed. It's romantic and is. Um, context, you know, um, you know, when you want to set the tone, but in a very, in a very sort of delicate way that can lead wherever you want and just put you in a good feeling as mm -hmm. opposed to, you know, <laughs> you know, strongly suggesting a sexual <laughs> encounter. You know, this could be simply like a romantic, you know, uh, evening eating yeah. dinner and then, you know, and, and the, not that you couldn't do that to the other things, but you know, when you have James Brown on the background, you listen to a song called sex machine. It's kind of, you're putting that on. There's a, there's a general vibe to that that you're trying to put off. Whereas this could lead to wherever you'd like it to go. And that's that subtlety, Josh, that you talked about. It can kind of lead you. It's as subtle that you could put it on in an elevator, but you can also listen to it and get the complex. Another thing we talked about the kinks, but I'd say here, there's complexity in the subtlety. And I know that sounds oxymoronic, but it's definitely true here as well. 
I think it's interesting too, Josh, that you were saying how they had different styles. And it, it would seem to me that Gilberto style won out here. You know, if, if Getz, you said that Getz wanted to play maybe a little bit, you know, faster or, or, or harder. Like, well, I, I forget exactly what you said to describe it, but it sounded like Gilberto, because this is not, if he was trying to like up the tempo or up the, 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 the energy, he, he failed. Like he lost that argument, it seems. Well, wasn't this like Getz trying to fit into Boleros too, Josh? Like the the type of song that the... the... The boleros, aren't they the um, like almost ballads, like Brazilian ballads kind of? And this was sort of Getz doing his take of it as an American. I, that, that's at least my understanding. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I I just read that they clashed because I guess they kind of recorded in different ways, or um, they were. I have to find the quote that Gilberto said something about Getz one time during recording um, that I can't remember. I can't do it justice, but um, I mean, everybody on here except Getz was Brazilian, right? The other guys who played the bass, uh, Sebastião Neto um, and Milton Banana, who played the drums, they're, they're Brazilians as well. So I think, like you said, Matt, I think Gilberto wins out in terms of the sound. Um one of the songs actually gets plays so softly on you can apparently hear him like moving the the uh the keys on the saxophone or something like that um, yeah I, I i know what you mean like the, the buttons are they called yeah, keys buttons whatever they are something like that the saxophone um, things but yeah john i don't know about the bolero um i'd have to look into that and did they did they uh totally like uh, what, did they have B for the rest of their lives? Was was, was that a fair kind of really the nail in the coffin? Were they able to reunite ever? Um, I think they did reunite. I read that somewhere. Um, Getz had a lot of personal issues. Um, I saw a lot of drug use, pretty much every drug. Uh, a lot of, uh, I think he was abusive and a lot of abusive relationships mm. with women. Um, and so... Um, but yeah, I think they did reunite like 10 years later or something on another album. So I don't know. I guess no hard feelings. And they or, did another one ahead of this, didn't they? Like another collaboration? Uh, this is, no, this is their first collaboration. I, I think they did something after this. Okay. There's, uh, a, there's an album with Samba in it um, that I'm trying to remember that I listened to as deeper context for this. Um, while you're talking, I'll, I'll look it up. Okay. What I, I thought it was interesting too, because I was thinking when you were when you were talking about when it was recorded, and then when it was released a year later, you know, and how different that was from the Mothers of Invention, which was essentially what two months, mm -hmm. you know, that they recorded and then released it. But um, so it's just it's it's it was not like that they were working on the production. It was just I want to sit on this because I don't think it's gonna sell it all. Yeah. But then he must have done it. Like did, did did somebody else force it? Like why do you? It's it's. I, I find that process interesting. It's like, okay, now it's ready. Like it needed a year to, to get, did he need convincing from somebody? Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe Bossa Nova just took off more or something. Uh, I mean, mm, they recorded right. it in two days, so yeah. <laughs> they're, yeah, they're there, good it musicians. Yeah, it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of layering or production or anything. So it didn't, yeah, it seems weird that it would take a while to do that. Yep. But um, also produced by another cool name, Creed Taylor. I yeah, I think that's Creed's a great name. We should bring yeah. that back. Two first names, Creed and Taylor. Mm -hmm. And I was incorrect. Stan Getz did a Bossa Nova album before this, but it was not with Gilberto. It was with a guy named Charlie Bird, and it's called Jazz Samba shortly before this. Yep. So that's what I was going for. Yeah, that album came out in 62. Yeah, but this is Getz and Gilberto's first collaboration. There's Getz incorrect. and Gilberto number two, which is a live album. Mm -hmm. And then the best of two worlds. Yeah, it's a reunion with with Gilberto in '76. Okay, so they did. A, looks like they did another album. Yeah, definitely recommend oh, and for me though. They're smiling on the album cover, so <laughs> they look like they're good. How good? So that's nice. Positive note we can end on. Yep. So yeah. check it out. This album is great, and play it at your next dinner party, and then you can give everyone background. Or just if you're in a bad mood or with the tenor of COVID and everything else in the world, this is just a nice little escape to slip into. And it doesn't overstay its welcome, which is a combing the stacks core phrase, which yeah, we all love. That's yeah. one of our core, 
core tenets on this show, I think. Yes, you should and come it's, up with it's, the combing the stacks Bible. Yeah, it's a it's a inter quote board, yeah. It's yeah. an interesting bookend to the Mothers of Invention album, which most certainly overstays its welcome. So, um, so yeah. Uh, 